Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Jeff Shalab, I manage the OAC. I'm joined here with um, the OAC faculty, Ankar Gatte, Ben Baer, Aaron Smith, Alan Giorno, and Keith Lockich. And we're here today to talk a bit about the OAC and in particular, how the OAC can help you become a new intellectual. Now, if you attended the March 6th conference that we had, how you can put a dent in the universe, um, you know, we talked a lot about what, what it is to be a new, new intellectual and Ayn Rand's view on that. Ankar will, will recap that in a moment. Uh, but we're going to assume that context as most of you registered for this event also, also registered and attended the conference. Um, if you didn't attend that conference or if you missed some of it, uh, no worries. I'll have recordings will be available on YouTube in the coming weeks so you can catch everything, everything there. Uh, this event will also be recorded and um, can be listened to uh, later, at a later point. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about the OAC and what it means to pursue an intellectual career. Uh, and then we'll talk, talk more about, about what the OAC is. And we're going to leave about 30 minutes uh, at the end for, for your questions. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to, to Ankar uh, for his remarks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to talk very briefly because we want to leave time, as Jeff said, for questions and, and what you guys have on your mind about the OAC. But let me just say that one way to encapsulate what the OAC offers, what it's trying to do, is it's trying to train people to think like an objectivist. There are many people who will call themselves objectivists, who I think both don't really understand the content of the philosophy and certainly don't practice its methodology. So a philosophy as a system, a system of ideas has both new content, new principles about uh, morality and politics, which are the most obvious, but also new principles about what knowledge is and how to acquire it. And therefore philosophy has both content and methodological advice. It has a view about what it looks like to think properly, what it looks like to uh, engage in reasoning, persuasion, what it looks like to rationally be convinced of an idea, and therefore what it looks like to rationally convince other people of ideas. And that is certainly true of objectivism. It's a radical new philosophy, and it has radical new things to say both about content and about methodology. And that can be hard to learn, hard to digest, because it's so different from one's training from basically from kindergarten into grade school, high school, and universities. You learn content and methodology that from objectivism perspective is wrong. It doesn't mean always it's totally wrong, but it doesn't mean it's not completely right. And so what the OSC way to think of it and what it really focuses on is that you gain training in the courses about how to properly digest the content of objectivism and how to really practice its methodology. And when we talk about the program, you'll see there's aspects of what we do that's focused more on content and that's focused more on thinking methods, writing and communication skills. The, and the OAC and more broadly ARI since its in, uh, creation in the 1980s has been, uh, a major focus has been to develop new objectivist intellectuals. And with the recognition that it's difficult, it's difficult to stand outside the mainstream and understand a new philosophy, understand its methodology, but that if Ayn Rand's ideas are to spread throughout the intellectual world and through then more widely through the culture, which is the Institute's kind of overarching mission to help foster that in the coming decades, what are, is needed is new intellectuals. So that means people who really understand objectivism and its essential principles, and that who can use it, its content and its methodology in their own new work. And whether they're in philosophy, 
They're in economics, they're in history, they're in literature, they're in psychology. If you're working in these fields to use both objectivism's content and methodology to really advance your knowledge in those fields and to help rethink and reshape those fields. That's what a new intellectual does, that that's their basic focus. And what the OEC is trying to do is help foster that. Um, and it gives you, so it gives primarily gives you content methodology, but it also connects you to people, both your fellow students. Um, so you meet other people who, who are um, sort of on the same career path and trajectory as you, and you can uh, form valuable relationships, friendships, uh, professional relationships, and you get connected obviously to the faculty, but more broadly to a, a network of objectivist intellectuals that, that ARI sort of helps foster and, and connect people uh, with. So, there's, so those are sort of the broad aims and broad benefits of the OAC. So let me stop there and pass the baton on to Keith. Okay, thanks Ankar. So Ankar just talked about ARI's purpose in running the OAC program and training new intellectuals. I'm gonna, I wanna say a little bit about how you should think about this for yourself. If you, if you attended the Ayn Rand Khan events on March 6th, you, know, you might've come away from it really inspired and excited about the idea of pursuing an intellectual career. And maybe you came to this session with the idea of finding out you know, how OAC could, could help with that. At the event, we heard from a whole group of people all of whom are pursuing intellectual careers in very different ways. I think one of the big takeaways from the event, and again, if you, if you missed the event, you know, as Jeff said, you can catch the recordings and you can see this for yourself. There's a wide variety of career paths that are open to people who are interested in this kind of work. Now, even though the individual paths that each of the people we heard from was quite different, I think there were some common themes that emerged about how to think about whether an intellectual career is the right fit for you. And there are just two points that I want to highlight on this. So I just I'll cover these briefly. So the first point that I think came out in the comments from some of the presenters is that if you're interested in an intellectual career, you should only choose that kind of work. I mean, you should, any, any career that you choose, but particularly an intellectual career, you should only choose it based on what you think you will find fulfilling and enjoyable. You know, it's easy to get fired up about enlisting for the cause. And Ankar just talked about, you know, ARI's mission and ARI's goal <clears throat> and why we offer this kind of training, because we want people to, you know, uh, pursue careers as intellectuals and, and join in a sort of crusade to impact the culture in a certain way. And if you're a fan of Ayn Rand's writings and philosophy, she has a very inspiring vision about, you know, the new intellectuals fighting to save the culture. But the career that you choose is the work that you'll be doing for the majority portion of your life. So it needs to be the kind of work that you love to do. There's no duty you know, to, to fight for any kind of cause. Um, I think we should all take inspiration from Howard Rourke and the Fountainhead, who's talking about why he does his architecture the way he does it and doesn't follow convention. Um, and he says, you know, I have, let's say, 60 years to live. Most of that time will be spent working. I've chosen the work I want to do. If I find no joy in it, then I'm only condemning myself to 60 years of torture. So if you're thinking about the idea of an intellectual career, the, it's, it's, you don't want to condemn yourself to 60 years of torture. You want to make sure that your primary goal is the pursuit of your own happiness in life. And it needs to be the case that being an intellectual and doing this kind of work is what brings you happiness. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second point is sort of a, a related to that because it has to do with the kinds of activities that go in to an intellectual career. And again, even though the types of careers that we heard about uh, at the conference were very different, there was a, such a wide range of, of paths and journeys and different kinds of work that people were doing. I think one thing that cut across all the presentations was the kinds of activities that are involved in intellectual work. And basically it comes down to in one form or another, teaching, writing, speaking, and then they're you know, doing high level 
in-depth research and thinking and then communicating the results of that thinking in some form. So one of the things you need to find out about yourself is whether you find these activities enjoyable or could you grow to find them enjoyable you know, with training and practice. So one of the things that OAC offers is, as Ankar said, is a certain amount of training in communication skills, writing and speaking on topics where you're applying objectivism to issues in the culture. And this can be a way to get a taste of what these activities are like and whether they might be a good fit for you. So those are two points that I wanted to bring out that you want to choose. You only want to be choosing an intellectual career if, if it's actually the kind of career that will, you know, what will bring you joy and happiness in your life. And part of the way to think about that is what are the kinds of activities that that career will involve? Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ben and Ilan are going to, are, are going to talk about more specifically certain kinds of intellectual career paths and what those might look like. So over to you, Ben. Yeah, thanks, Keith. I'm glad that you used the, the Rourke example of thinking about your motivation for wanting to have a career like this, because it sets me up well for uh, the point that I wanted to make about why going to the OAC is really valuable for the pursuit of that kind of career. And here, think about how Rourke isn't himself entirely self-taught. He goes to the Stanton Institute for Architecture for a while, drops out, but then studies with Henry Cameron. He realizes that there are skills related to his field that he needs to learn from people who really know the field well. And I think that's also true if you're talking about wanting to become some kind of professional philosopher or related kind of intellectual. There's a body of knowledge that you need to acquire if you want to be able to do that. And that's whether you're going to pursue a career, a more traditional academic intellectual career, or working for uh, something like the Ayn Rand Institute. I mean, I can offer my, myself as an example here. I had an undergraduate, I did an undergraduate degree in philosophy at a, at a regular university, um, went to a kind of regular philosophy PhD program. But uh, all along that course, I was also taking classes uh, in the predecessor version of the OIC, which was the Objectivist Graduate Center. Uh, and that's because I had the sense, well, first, there's, there's general background knowledge about philosophy, especially about the history of philosophy that I'm going to need. And that's what I, I got from my uh, kind of traditional academic studies. But I knew that I wasn't going to be able to get an in-depth knowledge about objectivism by taking ordinary college philosophy classes. Now, of course, there's, <clears throat> there's a lot that one can get from oneself, uh, by oneself, by, by reading the books, uh, by listening to lecture recordings. Back then, we didn't have nearly as many recordings available to us uh, uh, free or cheaply as we do now. It's something that, you know, so people who are self-studying self today can, I think, get pretty far. But even still, there is a real benefit in not just kind of passively listening to uh, recorded lectures, but to actually actively studying it by doing assignments, by being able to ask questions of experts and to get their feedback on your assignments. And that's something that I did um, for, I don't know, uh, five to seven years uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, as just a parallel track to my university studies. And I think that the material that I learned through the OGC at the time uh, was invaluable to both of the stages of my career, both my uh, 10 years as an academic professor of philosophy and then now at, at ARI. Uh, even, even when I was teaching in a normal university where I wasn't teaching objectivism, uh, the skills that I learned from uh, the, that version of the OAC were really instrumental in my being able to think about how to pick topics to teach, how to pick topics to research, what kind of arguments to make in my academic writing that I thought would be more persuasive to an audience, how to see connections among different issues that I think other philosophers weren't seeing. And then especially in uh, teaching, uh, there, I, there I think especially my, my teaching for undergraduates was heavily influenced by my OAC education insofar as I had to think about what were the best examples that were going to illustrate pretty abstract points. How was I going to motivate my students to be interested in, interested in these points? This was all uh, picked up from a variety of different forms of feedback that I got 
in that course of OAC education. And, I, and then, of course, when I come to uh, after 10 years, I come to the Ayn Rand Institute and now it's even it's doubly important and relevant. Um, and I think that there's a way, especially in this, uh, the current uh, job market for intellectuals, where there's a lot of uncertainty about whether a job is going to be available uh, in traditional academia. You know, if you want uh, working for the Ayn Rand Institute, for instance, to be one possible career path, OAC is a great way to plan for that. And I'll just mention one last thing, which is that uh, especially if you become uh, involved with us through the OAC and it's clear that you are pursuing some kind of professional intellectual path, uh, we will take notice of that. We will invest in you, not just by having you sit in our classes, not just by giving you feedback on your homework. We're going to try to mentor you. We're going to try to set you up with a mentor who's in your field, who knows your area of research and who knows what it takes to succeed in uh, the kind of career path that you've selected for yourself. There's a lot more to say about that, but that's something I hope you'll ask questions about. Um, so I will I'll wait until then to say more. Um, so let me turn it over to Elon now. Thanks, Ben. I just want to say a couple of quick things. If you think about uh, careers as intellectuals, I don't know how many of you who are on the call grew up knowing people who worked as intellectuals the way we know people who are lawyers or teachers in our lives. I didn't have anyone like that. So for me, it was not a career that I really knew much about and I was inspired to go into it thanks to Ayn Rand. And there, we've heard from Ben about one path that people take, which is an academic direction where you, you train in academia and you stay and you develop a career within that, that world. And I think it's super valuable. And for, some, for many people, that's the path that is the right fit for their interests. There's always been a second approach, which is the non-academic approach, and it, it, it's vast. It's, it's as varied as there are people interested uh, in being intellectuals. And I, one thing I would stress is that there's been a big change, I think, in my lifetime in what it means to be a non-academic intellectual or public intellectual. So traditionally, that meant either working through journalism or independent writing or being affiliated with a think tank or some research institution and those are still paths that people take and they're, there's, they're a good fit depending on your interest. And there are a lot of options in that world. I think it's important to take those options seriously. But I want to stress that I think there have been important changes in the world of the media, communication, the explosion of YouTube, and all the new opportunities for people to communicate and to be heard outside of venues where there are gatekeepers. And I think that's been a big change. And I would suggest that anyone who's interested in, in, in an intellectual career should recognize that there are more opportunities now than I think there were in the past for doing intellectual work outside academia. New models for funding, new ways if one is enterprising and entrepreneurial to create a career outside of the traditional paths. I would say, so we've heard about Howard Rourke and his career path. And I think there's a lot of inspiration if you've read the novel, interesting things to draw from that. One thing I would draw on this is there, there is no single path that someone else has done that you will emulate it to every concrete particular. So you can take inspiration from different paths you'll hear about today and from the, those that were at our conference, which you can, if you were there to hear it or you can watch the recordings. What I would say is take those as inspirations. Don't assume that your path has to follow exactly the same path that someone else has taken. It's really important because your interests are going to differ and it's for you to des design your path. How are you going to do that? And I think uh, the OAC is, is not just helpful. It's, I think it's a necessary condition. It's a necessary uh, aid for you to learn the philosophy in terms of its content, which you could do by reading. But I think the I want to stress a theme that Ankar raised, which is what makes I think the OAC really distinctive as a way of uh, sort of as an educational enterprise is that there's a real conscious effort to impart a methodological training, so a real emphasis on what it means to think from a particular intellectual framework, the philosophy of Ayn Rand, objectivism. And I think that is just, it's an incredible value to be able to gain that. And it's an accelerant in your career path as a new intellectual. Uh, I think speaking for myself, I gained a lot from uh, training at the Institute. I started when I was an undergraduate many years ago in the, one of the predecessor programs, uh, the one that Ben mentioned. And 
it's really helpful to think about the model of an apprenticeship or learning under a master or learning under real experts in this in the subject then it's hard to really uh, capture that briefly but the amount of feedback that the OIC provides and helps the individual uh, sort of process and and um, to turn into actionable improvement that is I think just a huge benefit because the, there's no other place on the face of the planet where you can gain access to experts in objectivism who can give you that kind of feedback and really accelerate you down the path towards your career. So I, I've learned a lot. I'd be happy to tell you a bit more about this in the Q&A if, you have, if you're interested in that. Uh, and let me hand it over to Aaron, uh, who's going to tell you a bit more about the curriculum. Okay, thanks, Alon. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Yeah, so I'll say something about the curriculum, some of the actual content. Uh, that you're going to be learning and what the what the courses are really like. Um, as Ben said, we've done a number of um, variations of what the Objectivist Academic Center is, how many years it takes, what things we teach, and so on. So we are always, always sort of tweaking it a bit, trying to make improvements and so on. Um, but the core of the OAC program is a three-year program uh, offering university-level courses taught by video conference, so you can be anywhere in the world and log on. Uh, which I think is important because we get people from literally from all around the world uh, joining into the program. You can expect to devote something like six to 10 hours per week, uh, you know, for instruction, reading, assignments, and so on. So it's like adding another university level course to your life. Um, and it's designed so that, I mean, many of our students are either working full time or they're in school full time. So it's designed to make that possible. Uh, classes are recorded, so if you happen to miss a live session, you can go back and hear it. So don't let that uh, intimidate you, uh, the fact that you're adding this to your calendar and when you're already busy. I was in a PhD program in philosophy when I did the OAC, and it was challenging, but I think uh, really worthwhile for me. Um, OAC faculty, um, our core faculty, we're all either professional philosophers or intellectuals with advanced degrees in other fields. All of us have spent many years studying Ayn Rand, uh, and we've all gone through some version of the OAC, as you're hearing uh, now. We love our jobs, so this is not a slog for us. This is enjoyable. Um, many of us uh, are teachers at heart, and uh, uh, we really care for our students. And so this is a, a kind of an enjoyable aspect of our work uh, as well. Um, and I think that comes across uh, when you interact with faculty. Um, something about our approach to teaching. First of all, we don't assume that students agree with objectivism. So this is not, so there are a couple things here. One, um, I, we don't try to teach them that objectivism is right or true. We try to develop their understanding of what objectivism is, what it stands for, what its ideas are, what the arguments underlying its positions are, so that the students can then better understand where things stand with, with, with respect to objectivism and uh, what they think of it. Um, so they're not pushed in one way or the other. Now, of course, the faculty, uh, we are all objectivists in the sense that we think objectivism as a philosophy is true, and which is why we've devoted ourselves to it. Um, but we don't push that on the students, which I think, I think is important. Um, the program is really for people who have a serious interest in objectivism and in pursuing some kind of career that's informed in a significant way by objectivism, whether you're trying to be um, a professional intellectual um, or an intellectual professional, as we sometimes put it. Um, so our goal is to deepen your understanding of objectivism. And part of what that requires, and this informs our curriculum, part of that what it requires is widening your understanding of philosophy as a subject. What are the problems that philosophers deal with? Um, what are the different solutions various philosophic thinkers have, uh, have, pr have put forward for these uh, problems? And then how objectivism uh, approaches them. And so it's having a wider understanding of philosophy. But it's also about improving your ability to think objectively. Uh, and including being objective about objectivism, like how much do you really know? How much do you really understand about it? Filing things in ways that you say this, okay, this, I don't really understand that well. This, I don't know if I even think that's true. This I agree with, but I'm not sure if I could argue for it. it it's in terms of being more critical and more objective about the way you approach uh, objectivism as a philosophy. Um, I'll say something about the course offering. So I said it's a three-year program. So the first year is a year-long seminar in objectivism. So it's all about objectivism. Um, we, you, we 
from basically from metaphysics to art. So it covers the covers the range. And we read a lot of works by Ayn Rand herself, as well as drawing on uh, Dr. Leonard Peikoff's Objectivism, the philosophy of Ayn Rand and some of his course lectures and so on. Um, the way we've been doing this recently is uh, there are lectures by Ankar Gatti here, uh, and then other faculty lead uh, discussion sections with the students where they can kind of process, talk about, ask questions about the content of the lecture, go over homework assignments, talk about like what's right and what's wrong and what's confusing people um, so that you get real interaction with the faculty. Uh, the second year uh, is introduces a historical component. So I said that broadening students' understanding of this, the field of philosophy and what's been done in philosophy and what the problems are, that's where this gets addressed, I think, most directly. So you can study philosophers like Plato. I Like this year, I did a unit on Plato. Um, Ankar did something on Hume. So, uh, and, and others did, you know, other philosophers, but it's about trying to look at other major histor historical thinkers getting into their ideas, into their philosophy. Why did they argue what they do? Um, how does this compare or contrast with an objectivist approach? Um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the philosophy component of the second year. There's also another major component, which is the writing component. So uh, Keith, who's uh, here on camera, Keith teaches the writing component uh, to this. And this is really about, if you're gonna pursue an intellectual career, a lot of what that, in, much of what that involves is communicating uh, through writing whether it's articles or essays or books or whichever, and, or even an op-ed, for example. And writing from a philosophic perspective, you're talking about some issue in the culture, but you're bringing a philosophic perspective to it. And you have to take into account an audience who has a certain kind of context of knowledge or values and so on. And you're trying to bridge that. You're trying to make a communication um, from yourself to, to the audience and trying to move that audience in a certain direction. And that's a real skill. This is not remotely obvious as they quickly, students quickly find out. <laughs> this is a very difficult task. Uh, and, uh, and Keith has been an excellent teacher of this over the years and um, students universally uh, love that and uh, find it challenging too. So uh, that's year two. Year three, uh, we look at a range of contemporary intellectuals and intellectual trends. So this is looking at today's culture, today's thinkers. Uh, from the perspective of analyzing their arguments and thinking about the issues from an objectivist perspective, um, which I think is also a skill uh, and it takes time to sort of make your own in effect. Um, and we read, um, like I did a unit on um, uh, the kind of modern interest in stoicism today, kind of that modern stoic trend. Um, uh, what, do, what, was the one, uh, what was the one that Greg did? The book Majid Nawaz radical radical yeah uh, so uh, again we, we looked at a number of things and you did you did one on a contemporary ethics about trolley problems um, but yeah this is looking at contemporary things uh, and there are also uh, a, there's also a written and oral communication component to this section as well so students write uh, uh, analysis papers uh, they do oral uh, like oral presentations which they get feedback on uh, so that's it has a little bit of a sense of what the course offerings look like over the one, the first, second, and third year uh, of the program. So if I wasn't go didn't go too long there. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can turn to Jeff. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, I'll, I'll say a little bit more uh, about the administration of the OAC. Uh, I do before I go over these details. Just want to stress that everything we that I'm going to go over, uh, including the application and registration that's available at einrand.org slash OAC. Uh, so that's where you'll find all the information about the program, find the link to apply or to register as an auditor. Uh, you'll also find there a YouTube playlist that includes content from the OAC. This is a great way to sample uh, what it's like to be a student in the program. Uh, although you'll be a passive student, it's, it's the content is mainly lecture excerpts. Uh, and you can you can listen. Uh, you can actually watch the first lecture that Ankar gives in the Objectivism seminar course. So that's in the playlist, uh, and that, that's all at einrand.org/oac. Uh, the playlist is also available on on our YouTube channel, uh, ARI's YouTube channel. Um, so let me just say, you know, there's two ways to do the OAC. You can be a graded student, uh, or you can you can audit audit the program and. If you're pursuing an intellectual career, what, what we've been talking about today you know, appeals to you and, and you wanna be you know, in the world of ideas, 
uh, as your career and, and make that your life's work, you want to do the OAC as a graded student. Graded students have to submit assignments and they get you know, feedback from, from the instructors on those assignments. Um, and that, that's a significant component of, of what it is to be, to be a graded student. And that's the main difference between being a student versus just auditing the program. Uh, graded students proceed in order through the curriculum. So you'll start with year one, uh, go through to year three. Uh, advancement in, in the program is by invitation only. Uh, so you're, you are expected to perform, to, to be um, participating regularly, uh, and to uh, keep up with all your assignments uh, and do well in them. Uh, you also, as if you're a graded student, you're, you can apply for financial scholarships, uh, including covering the complete tuition. So in, you can request that when you complete the application. Uh, don't, don't let financial concerns concern you uh, about the tuition. Um, the best thing to do is apply, apply for, for a tuition scholarship uh, and, and go from there. Um, so if you're not pursuing an intellectual career, but you're interested in the content of the OAC, perhaps for, for personal growth, you want to better understand objectivism so you can apply it in your own life. Uh, the auditing is, that's why the auditing option exists. You participate right alongside graded students to so get the same educational experience. You have access to these assignments. We recommend you do them if you want to, but that's totally optional. Uh, you also you have the, you can participate um, in instructor office hours, as can graded students. So if you're if you're an auditor, it's really the similar the same experience as as a graded student, uh, except you're not submitting assignments and uh, you don't have that that expectation of oh I have to be there. Um, every week or uh, you don't have to be there live every week as a student, I, sh I should say that as well. Uh, all the classes in the OAC are recorded. They're made available, we usually get the recordings up within an hour after they've concluded. So if you can't attend live, whether you're a student or an auditor, uh, you'll have access to the recordings right away. Um, auditors, so another difference between students and auditors is auditors can choose which course they wanna participate in. So maybe you're only interested in doing Keith's writing course. You really want to develop that skill. You can sign up as an auditor only for that course. Uh, so that, that's another difference. Uh, if you're participating in the OAC, so we generally recommend, what we look for in terms of your experience with objectivism is that you, we assume that you've read The Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, uh, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, The Virtue of Selfishness, and Objectivism, The Philosophy of Ayn Rand by Leonard Peikoff. Uh, so this is going to be assumed knowledge. Many of the, these books or aspects of these books are reread as part of the, part of the coursework, uh, really revisited and explored uh, along with, with other, uh, other works from Rand's corpus. Um, but those are kind of the core, the core texts that, that we recommend you've read before you start the program. Um, that said, you know, if you're worried, oh, I haven't read all of these things and I don't know if I'm going to have time to read them all before I apply. There are a lot of ways to learn about objectivism today. Uh, so if you feel like you, know, you have a good grasp of the fundamentals of the, the philosophy, the basic ideas, uh, you, can, you can apply. It's not that you, you won't get in strictly if you haven't you know, read one of these books. Um, just a note about deadlines. So graded students, the application deadline is July 12th. Now it's a little ways away, but I would say if you're excited about the program and thinking about applying, uh, I strongly recommend that you go ahead and apply. There's not a tremendous benefit to waiting if you feel like you're ready. Uh, we already have applications coming in. Uh, application has been up for, for only um, about a week now, but we are already getting applications. And yeah, why well, put it off? Go ahead, get that off your list and, and we'll assess your application. Um, if you're going to audit the program, we recommend you register by September 10th to be in to uh, to be ensured that you're enrolled by the first class. Uh, you can register as an auditor later after classes have started, uh, but then you'll be, you'll be behind, there'll be content to catch up on. So we do recommend registering to audit the program by September 10th as well. Um, the tuition for the coming year for students, is going to be $4,590. Uh, and again, you can apply for tuition scholarships. And for auditors, it's $3,990. Uh, per full year course or uh, 1995 if you're only going to take one of the, the second year courses or the writing or the philosophy course that are covered in the second year. And I just add, you know, what you're paying for 
and you're paying that tuition is you're getting access and you're getting the content in the OAC that's not available anywhere else. You're getting this regular interaction with the OAC faculty on a weekly basis for 24 weeks. Uh, so that's you know, half the year that you can spend over half the year in, with regular interaction with the OAC faculty, getting access to con content that's invaluable uh, to you know, better understand a philosophy that helps you to live your life better. So uh, I think it's well worth the, the tuition. And what the reason that it is a tuition-based program is because of the, uh, you know, the number of hours and the kind of intellectual labor that, that's put into it. Um, and then courses, is just the calendar. So I, I mentioned most courses, courses run about 20, around 24 weeks. Some go a little bit longer. Um, and they're generally from mid-September to about to mid-April. Uh, so that's, that's the OAC calendar. And with that, I think we can turn it over to audience questions. And maybe we should remind people about how to ask questions. If you're watching with us on Zoom, best way to do that is to use the Q&A module, which I see a few of you already have already discovered. Let's hover over your screen. There's a button at the bottom. This is Q&A. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we are monitoring the chat on YouTube. I don't think you need to use Super Chat for this one. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the regular chat as it's occurring. And if there are questions there, I will, we will try to answer them. Um, we did get a question from Zoom uh, wondering about whether we would ever cover subjects aside from philosophy and writing, maybe history, maybe economics, maybe psychology. Uh, we don't offer those now, um, mainly I think because we don't have, I mean, our primary focus is, is philosophy. Um, also, we, that's our expertise. So, uh, I don't know what the future will hold, but if there are any historians, economists, or psychologists out there who uh, we, we someday hire, we'll see what happens. But the primary focus is definitely philosophy. And did anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I'll say something. So the question is, like, isn't it good to have knowledge of other fields? So yes, it's good to have knowledge of other fields. And if that's your particular interest, so if you're what I want to become is a professional psychologist, or I want to become a professor of economics or of history. Yeah, you need to be studying those as well. And the so two things about when we're talking about the OEC three-year program, as it was sketched, it's meant that you can do it concurrently with being in university. So, and it's undergraduate level. So if you're interested in history or psychology, study these in university. There's a lot of knowledge you can gain. And that's true of philosophy as well. If you wanna become a philosopher, there's a value um, in understanding the field and that you wanna become a philosopher means you're interested in the field. You're interested in the subject. You might be especially interested in objectivism, but. I don't think someone who's just interested in objectivism is actually interested in philosophy and should think of themselves as I'm embarking on a philosophy career. It's no, you're embarking on some other kind of career if you're interested in objectivism, but not really the subject of philosophy. So for all these subjects, there's knowledge to be gained in universities and elsewhere, and you should be in pursuit of that knowledge as well. And it's an undergrad, so it's not as though if you do three years of the OAC, you become an intellectual. That's not how it works. Um, it takes, it, becoming an intellectual is, it's fun, but it's challenging. It takes a lot of work um, and it takes a lot of study. And there's things we offer beyond the OAC three-year program for people who are really now embarked on the quest to become an intellectual. There's I've got a question from Brandon here in the Zoom chat. Uh, are OAC scholarships available for students that are between a master's and a PhD? Yes. Yeah, there's no restrictions on, on who scholarships are available for, uh, you know, other than you have to be accepted to the program and, and apply for the scholarship within it. But other than that, they're, uh, they're merit, scholarships are merit-based, so we, we evaluate your, uh, your application for a scholarship as part of your application of the student program. 
uh, you know, we make every effort to, to support students uh, with, with scholarships. Uh, a related question about this is, uh, you know, is the tuition tax deductible? So if you're, I mentioned, you know, our, our scholarships are merit-based. So if you're, if you receive a scholarship, but you say, you know what, I would rather pay the tuition. So if you're a graded student, it is tax deductible uh, if you've qualified for a scholarship. Um, if you're an auditor, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not tax deductible. And these are just IRS uh, regulations about what can and can't be uh, tax deductible. So. There's a question, I think, uh, Ben, you responded to this in the YouTube super chat, um, but I think it's worth bringing it into the broadcast. There was a question, can OAC be taken from outside the US? And the question I think was in the UK, I, I, I missed it, it's, it's zoomed past. The answer is yes. We have a number of students from all sorts of countries and Aaron, you can tell us how many countries there are represented this year. We, we've had a large number. I took the predecessor course when I was living in the UK. It's, it's totally doable. We have people all over Europe right now and in other countries. It's just become easier and easier for people to be part of the OAC thanks to technology. And we're always looking for ways to re reduce the friction in terms of people's access to the program. So yeah, Aaron, maybe you could just shed some light on that. Yeah, so uh, this year, I'm not gonna remember all of them, but here just off the top of my head, um, South Korea, France, Germany, Netherlands, Brazil, Portugal, Argentina. That gives you a sense. <laughs> uh, and so one, one of the things that students, um, if they're in Europe or they're in Asia, or they're just far away, there's a time zone issue. So uh, I know we have a student in France who's often up uh, very late at night <laughs> uh, watching the class. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's definitely something that um, you can- We do can... schedule the sessions with that in mind, especially since we have a lot of European students, for example, in our first year program, there's a weekly discussion session that meets and we have one earlier in the day for the European students and one later in the day uh, for everybody else. We haven't, worked, we haven't worked one into our schedule yet that's easy for the students in Asia to get to, but uh, maybe someday. But there, and there are other ways of uh, engaging in class participation too, even if for whatever reason, time zone, it's 4 a.m. or something and you can't make it. Um, there we have uh, forums on, a, like we have a website basically where you have a class website and you can participate in the forums and so on. So you can be, uh, be engaged in the class even if you're not always able to attend live. So uh, there's a couple of questions about um, the level of depth. Uh, first of all, I, I will, someone asks, I'll be doing a graduate degree in philosophy. Will I be in the same class with people without any background in philosophy? Uh, well, right now, the first year course is uh, a course that is taught to some people with background, with background in academic philosophy and some people without, though, of course, everyone in that course has some degree of background in philosophy insofar as we definitely uh, require uh, a, a certain level of knowledge about objectivism to be admitted into the first year course. And we're still, I think, working on uh, what's the best way to divide up the different levels of interest and expertise. And, uh, you know, there are definitely some activities that are uh, that we offer that are more exclusively for people with a background in academic philosophy. There may be ways in which that gets worked into the OAC curriculum itself sometime soon. Um, but it, if you're doing a graduate degree in philosophy, you should definitely get in touch with us one way or the other. We'd very much like to uh, find out more about uh, what you're interested in studying and how we can help you in that study, whether it's through the OAC or through any number of other uh, networking opportunities that we have and offer and ways that we help people to study more about objectivism. And, and I think just, just historically, I've, I've been teaching in the program for about seven years now. Um, I usually don't find that there's a huge disconnect in levels of knowledge, even if there's a, diff, a definite difference in the amount of objectivism or philosophy that a person's been exposed to part of the way Part of the reason is the way we do the curriculum. Um, but I, I don't think that, I, ne I never found that to be a kind of a jarring or odd sort of experience. I think it's when they're approaching objectivism, um, 
yeah, Anka, you can say you want to say something. Yeah, I want to say I'll put it on a more positive spin, which is it was we have people from very different academic backgrounds, and that's a feature, not a bug. It, you'll find it interesting when you're talking about philosophical issues. And if you have a background in philosophy and someone who doesn't has a background in economics or history, that what's similar and what's different in how you approach it. And you'll often get that it's, um, and I think this happens in any specialized field, that someone not in the field can't make heads or tail of how you're approaching it. Why would you approach it like this? Why are you assuming A, B, and C? So, and sometimes it will be, yeah, you're right about A, B, and C, and the other person learns, oh yeah, that is a context that if you bring that to it, it's illuminating. And sometimes what you'll discover is, no, A, B, and C are all wrong. The field sort of assumes they're right, and that's how I come into it, and someone not in it just finds it bizarre, and they're right to find it bizarre. Um, so it's actually useful if you're in philosophy to see the field from the perspective of other people's eyes, because the field is supposed to be it's a philosophy for living on earth, and it's supposed to be that it helps everybody. And part of your job as a philosopher is to think, I'm helping everybody think, not academic philosophers to think. So it's often useful that, that you're in an environment where it's not just people in academic philosophy. Yeah, and related to that, there's a question that came in about from someone who's interested in being an auditor, but wonders if auditors will get feedback on assignments. Well, the auditors are usually the people in the class uh, who aren't coming from a philosophy background. Uh, as And as Ankar mentioned, I mean, I think they contribute a lot to our course. And in a way that I think the person's asking the question will get some value from because, so we don't give uh, grades to auditors. Uh, we don't give written feedback on the assignments that they submit, uh, but they're free to do the assignments if they want. And they're free to, talk with the other auditors about in compare and contrast notes on the assignments. And you're also free to ask questions in class and to set up office hours with instructors. So uh, even though they uh, you don't get that kind of formal feedback, there's a lot of ways of getting informal feedback. And what we've found over the last few years is that, especially when auditors participate in class, uh, they add the kind of value that Ankar was just referring to. For a long time, we actually didn't think we wanted to have auditors because we thought it might, uh, I don't know, distract things from what we were doing in class. But it turns out the opposite is true, that they, they their perspective enriches the discussion in lots of ways uh, that you, you we wouldn't have anticipated, or at least I didn't anticipate. Um, so, you know, we're very happy to have the auditors. And uh, there's, it depends on what you want to get out of it. But I think that if you want to get feedback out of it, even as an auditor, there's a lot of ways to do it. Yeah, and we got we got a question here uh, from a high school student. This might be more for Jeff. Um, uh, if I apply today, will my application be held until I participate in two years? I'm a junior in high school. Let's say we generally don't get this question, and most people, I would generally encourage that you you would apply, you know, when you intend to do the program. Um, and I would say consider doing the pro applying and. If you're accepted, consider doing the program uh, and, and trying to find time for it. The OAC is one of those experiences that I think once you're in it and you realize the value, you may you can juggle your priorities and make it a priority. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, we get this question of, oh, maybe should I wait until I'm done with college or until I'm done with school, and then I'll have more time to do the OAC. And I mean, you can do that, but it's not certain that you'll have more time later in life. Uh, and you're not going to get the benefits of being in the program until you, until you're in it and until you're you know, learning, you know, objectivism is a philosophy for living on earth and for helping you to live your life better. And the sooner you get that knowledge, the better you can apply it to your life. So yeah. you, you'll make better decisions. You, it can impact your career decisions. It can impact what you study at school. Um, I, I personally, when I did the OAC, I did it after college and, I, know, I wish I had discovered Ayn Rand earlier and I wish I had discovered the OAC or definitely would have impacted what I studied. So I'll add one sentence to that. I agree with that. Second, uh, I'd like to know, uh, so who you are, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. So I would like to see the application just to find out if yeah. somebody's interested in the program. Like I want to know who you are. And I, I, I actually I met my... with uh, Kudwi this week, so I'll fill you in yeah. or last week. 
There might be a premise that you have to be in college to take the program. If Mm -hmm. that's driving the question, then the answer is no, you don't. We do have high school students. I think it's, it's, we, 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 um, it's not a, it's not a guarantee, but we definitely, definitely apply right away. And we'll consider you even if you're in high school. One wrinkle on that. Do we require that they're 18? Um, If with parental consent, um, people who are under 18 can take the program. Jeff, there was a question Uh, that was in the queue that said something about what you're wanting to answer live, but I don't see it there anymore. Did you? Yeah, there was a question about someone asking about pursuing a second career, um, a more intellectual career. Does someone want to take that? Uh, and there's also actually, I should mention a, a question somebody posted in the Zoom chat that's related. That they, they, they're a they're a businessman. Uh, they want to be an auditor. They don't think that they can they can pursue a second career, but they want to get uh, good at writing, debating, uh, persuading people. I mean, I think both of those are options to think about. I know of uh, several people who started out in a in a, a non academic, non intellectual, even obviously career uh, in in the business world. You know, uh, and did that for a couple of decades even, but then decided later in life that they they wanted to become a professional intellectual and they were very successful at it. So it's 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 never too late. I mean, look up, if if you want to learn more about this, look up the story of the late, great John Lewis, who uh, did something just like that. Um, as to somebody who's uh, just wanting to acquire these skills uh, without... Uh, uh, knowing for sure what they want to do with him uh, afterwards, th- that's possible too. That is, I think, what the auditor uh, kind of uh, a student being an auditor is for. Uh, and I think there's a lot of people from a lot of different stages in life who are auditors uh, and uh, I think end up discovering new things that they can do with what they've learned that they might not have even thought of before, whether that involves a new career or not. One quick thought about um, switching careers, uh, so starting a new direction. I think one of the things that is involved in that kind of decision is getting an understanding of what the second career really looks like. And I think that knowing what a career looks like is true, whether it's your first or your second career. I think that's one of the big benefits the OEC can give you. It's, it really gives you a, a flavor of all the different kinds of activities involved in an intellectual career whichever path or direction you take. And I think if you want to make that kind of decision, it's a good, it's a good starting point is try the OAC. Is it, are you interested in the readings? Do you find that you can't get enough of it? Do you find the writing is really compelling for you? If you don't, then those are things to think about. Is it what do re, maybe you want to reshape your second career path? Or maybe this is a kind of confirmation, but I think it's a very uh, helpful way to get more data uh, in thinking about your next step. Um, there are a couple of other questions here. So do you recommend having an idea ahead of time for how you want to use the knowledge gained in the OAC? Aside from just wanting to learn how to think objectively about your life. Um, I would say, you know, it depends if you're, it depends where you are in your, in your career development. Um, and if you're thinking about the student program or the auditing program, if you're thinking about the student program, I mean, generally what we're looking for in terms of you know, is this person interested in an intellectual career? Is, is, are you serious about that? Have you actually started to take some steps towards that path? You don't need to be, you know, in a PhD program, you don't need, but um, we do want to see some kind of concrete steps towards that direction of, that, that show that, yeah, this, this person is, uh, it's likely that person you know, will continue to, will pursue an intellectual career. Uh, even if they're not not yet in one. Um, I think there's a lot of flexibility even in that. I mean, we're looking for signs that a person has real potential to be some kind of intellectual professional or professional intellectual. Uh, and there are a lot, the variety of different kinds of signs that there can be. I mean, so somebody in YouTube says, would you recommend OAC to someone who has no intention in pursuing the career in philosophy? Well, 
Uh, it depends, of course, but I do want to emphasize that we're not, although I, people pursuing careers in philosophy are, I think, a major focus for us. They're certainly not the only. There are a lot of other kinds of professional intellectuals. We can One can be in cognate fields, uh, law, psychology, economics, uh, linguistics, et cetera, that I think draw heavily on knowledge of philosophy where we are very happy to make an impact. And so where, where what you learn about philosophy is going to pay dividends for you as an intellectual in other related fields, uh, for sure. Is there a capacity limit to the first year class? Uh, no, we don't have a strict capacity limit, I would say. Um, you know, there is a certain limit in terms of how many graded students we can uh, we can take per year, but um, th there's definitely no limit to auditors. And we're not, I think if, if we got to the point where we really had to restrict capacity, that would be a good thing, but we're, we're not there yet. And we're looking at ways to add, add other faculty. So we kind of expand to the demand or, or shrink to the demand, but. Yeah, I, I think the main constraint is, is us, is, is having enough teachers and someone in the Zoom Q and A also asked, do you have, do you plan on having junior fellows as teaching assistants in coming years? And part of the reason he's asking, I'm sure is because this is the first year where we've, we've done that, where we hired a whole cohort of junior fellows just to help be teaching assistants. Um, and that has helped us expand the number that we can reasonably admit. And it's also relevant when thinking about future careers in, a, uh, in as an intellectual, because, well, we're also hiring junior fellows, uh, which, junior, which you know, some of whom we hope go on to be you know, permanent scholars at the Institute, some of whom will go on uh, to careers in academia. And that's, so that's a, there's a virtuous cycle here, I think. Does, what do one of the faculty want to take on? So how much does the Dr. Peikoff's objectivism through induction guide the OAC's approach? Ankar, you want to take that one? Yeah, it guides it but in a non-obvious way. So the objectivism through induction is actually quite a sophisticated course. And um, people can think they understand it when they don't. If you put the same kind of issue in more primitive terms, but primitive, so I don't, primitive is not a derogatory term here, but so simpler terms, it's the OAC stresses, what's your evidence for the, a viewpoint that you're saying is true? And here I want to say, what's your evidence? Not what's Ayn Rand's evidence or what's evidence someone gave in a talk or an essay you heard, but what's your evidence? Why do you actually think this is true? What would you advance as here's the data and here's how you integrate that data. Here's the argument that establishes this is true. And we put a major emphasis on the evidence and the arguments and that you're in the possession of them, not somebody else's, but that you actually understand it. So in that sense, there's a, it is in the same vein as what objectivism through induction is stressing. There is a question that came in in Zoom that's related to another question that came in on YouTube. So the Zoom question was, could you comment on what ARI offers as further intellectual development post OAC? And on YouTube, someone asked, does the program do anything to help philosophy students get published in academia? And uh, the answer to the second question actually is, yes, there is a way in which uh, we do that. And that's an example of one of the further forms of intellectual development post OAC. I, I mentioned that we have a mentorship program and that if you are, especially let's say a graduate student in philosophy, we will pair you with an existing professional objectivist philosopher and they're able to offer uh, feedback on drafts. They're able to offer tips for how to get articles published among other kinds of advice related to a career in academia. There are also, we also offer uh, working groups where there are people uh, reading contemporary academic papers and books in philosophy from an objectivist, they're, and they're reading them from the perspective of analyzing them as an objectivist. 
Um, I'm skipping one right now that I should be at because I want to be at this uh, info session. That's, that's one that's studying a lot of works in contemporary ethics. And I think there are plans on the horizon for doing more on along those lines in philosophy of science um, and, and related fields. There, there are a couple we can do very quickly. So one person asks, is, object, is the OAC related to a program that they have at the Severo Institute, I guess in the Czech Republic? No, we're not related to that program. Uh, another question saying $4,000 is a big commitment for young students. What about a micro OAC, which is introductory in cost below? We're considering, uh, we're in the process of considering um, offerings like that, shorter, more introductory things that are sort of pre-OAC. Um, the question about uh, hours per day and days during the week, that might be better to take offline and have an in-person discussion with Jeff Shilaba, for instance, um, who can help with that kind of, those kinds of details. It depends and, on what day of the week it is. Some days yeah. More. <laughs> yeah. I think we're running out of time here. So Jeff, what should we, uh, um, yeah, we can, we can wrap up. Um, what did we, one question, is there a benefit to applying early, um, that does not apply early won't have an impact on scholarship availability. Um, so, but I would say if, if you're not going to, if you're ready to apply, you know, I, I encourage you to apply. I don't, it's not, is there a benefit to waiting? I don't really see a benefit to waiting if you're ready. Um, and if you're planning to apply for whatever reason, do let us know so you're on our radar and that, that, that's helpful. And to do that or for any other follow-up questions, please reach out to us at OAC at einrand.org. So with that, I think we will wrap up. And did anybody have any final thoughts or comments? Seeing that there are none, I'll thank everybody for joining us and, and hope to see uh, more from all of you. I hope to see some of these names in the participant list uh, sending us applications and I hope to see you in class uh, next year. So I'll just put up on the screen for one last time that website that Jeff was touting. This is where you should go to find out more about the details of the program and to apply. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Good one.